Shaka Shimanjikoa, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. And uh, as you have just heard, maybe you just heard, maybe you didn't go. Um, our, in our department, uh, we teach literature, Anglo American literature. We also teach history and culture of Anglo American countries. But what we are also interested in doing is English linguistics and translating and interpreting from, but also into English. And what I'm going to talk about uh, now is this bit, English linguistics. Uh, what do linguists do? What do you think linguists do? What is linguistics? What is it all about? If you come here, you'll have to do some of it. So what do you think it is? What do you think? I have no idea. No idea. That's a fair, honest answer. How about you? I don't know. No, no? They study language deeply. They study language. Right. They study language. Why? To understand it better, right? They study language to understand it better. They're trying to explain, they try to explain how language works. They look at various languages like Chinese, Italian, Swahili, or English um, to find out how these languages work and then see what those languages have in common, right? And to describe that, the commonalities across languages. That is an interesting bit. Um, now, one thing that you can say about language for sure is that it is a very effective tool uh, for communicating ideas, right? Uh, very efficient. You can get across uh, a whole lot of various ideas. But there are ways of communicating communicating ideas. Can you think of anything else? Can you, can you pass on a message without using words? What do you think? Bada, what do you think? Well, you can use your body language. You can use body language, you can use, what are these? <laughs> gestures, <laughs> right? And gestures are very powerful tools for communicating. And sometimes, actually, gestures may be more efficient than language, right? Let me give you an example of one gesture, a big naughty gesture. What does it mean to give somebody the finger? What do you do when you give somebody the finger? What do you think? Mm -hmm. That's an American idiom. What do you think? <laughs> when do you, some, do you give somebody the finger? I'm not sure I want to start my time here by giving <laughs> something. <laughs> something like that. That's a very nice answer. Okay. Right, that's what you do when you give somebody the finger. And you're right, it is not a nice gesture. You don't do that, right? That aside, being, being a very rude gesture, very impolite, right, uh, is very effective, right? And if you're in that situation, somebody cutting in front of you in the car, you have to communicate the, your dislike very fast, very quickly, right? If you were going to translate it into words and yell it outside your window, you know, I hate you because you just cut in front of me and I'm so mad at you. That's not going to work, right? Um, so, in this sense, uh, or in this situation, gesture is more effective than language. But there are other situations where language is much more effective than gestures. Um, what, how would you, which gesture would you use to communicate this idea? I was so mad at you when you came in front of me yesterday. You think, you know, think of what happened on the highway the day before. Which gesture would you use? What do you think? Yeah, how do, how do we use a gesture that expressed this yesterday and I was mad at you? And it gets even more interesting if you think about sentences like these. I, if you had cut in front of me, I would have been so mad at you. Right? That cannot be translated into gestures at all. So what it is that language does that gestures don't do? What do gestures depend on? That language does not have to depend on. Feeling, feeling. Well, they express feelings, that too, but that's not quite what I'm after. Situation. Situation. We call it the context. Here and now. Gestures are very much here and now. Language doesn't have to be, right? You can think about things that happened, has the pattern happened yet, right? Uh, will never happen. You can make things up in language and people will understand, right? Uh, if you think about children's literature, Children already know that, that it works like that, right? So this is an example from a modern English classic. Right? Um, here is a terrible creature with terrible claws and terrible teeth and his terrible jaws. Right? He has no knees and turn out toes and a poisonous word at the end of his nose. His eyes are orange, his tongue is black. You can see a creature, you can 
imagine what the creature looks like? The words told you, right? You've never seen anything like that before. Right? Um, actually, it is a graph below from a very popular book, <laughs> children's book. Uh, all right, so that, that is uh, interesting that language allows you to do that. It's, very, it's a very versatile tool for communicating ideas, right? And that versatility is bought at a price. It is a very complex tool. It's a very complex code for coding messages. Actually, if you were looking for a good secret code um, to pass on secret messages, right, it's much better than making up one, it's finding a language that other people around you don't know. That is going to work much better than an artificial code. And for example, the US Army um, made use of that um, in the Second World War when they uh, used American Indian languages to uh, code their secret messages in that situation. So it was almost like Navajo languages were used in the Second World War uh, for coding secret messages. And actually they were very successful, they were never broken. Right? Well, actually, maybe one of the one of very few military codes that were not broken at all in war history. Right? Um, so languages are um, very versatile and they're also very complex. How many of those codes are there in the world? Well, somebody counted that there are about 6,909. Now, who do you think would, would be able to count uh, that? Who would get that information? Who would, whose business would it be to count languages? Actually, it's people who translate Bible. Who translate Bible. It's, there is a Christian uh, linguistic organization that uh, puts, uh, what they do is they describe what are known languages in order for translators to be able to translate Bible into those languages. And they have a very good idea about how many languages there are in the world and uh, put out uh, um, a publication, so-called Ethnologue, in, and in the 16th edition, you can find uh, this number. Uh, it's a very good resource. If you're interested, Google it. You might find some interesting, informa interesting information about languages around the world. So we have uh, a number of very, uh, great number of quite complex codes, 6,000 and something. How many languages do children uh, learn when they, um, uh, how, how many uh, languages do children learn? Mm, they learn language and then they learn two, four languages. But, right, in their childhood you learn probably one of those codes, maybe, maybe two. Possibly there are some children who learn three, right, they're the trilingual. But monolingualism is pretty common. How, how do you learn, how do children learn language? How do they do that? Repetition. By repeating? Repeating what? Sounds, words. Uh-huh. Of their parents, what mom and dad says, right? Yeah, agree? Um, definitely a lot of vocabulary is learned that way, right? You learn words. Uh, by listening to your mom and dad, and, and, or possibly the bad words you learn at kindergarten. Right? But these words we say they're culturally transmitted, passed on from parent onto a child. Right? How do you uh, how do you think about grammar? Do you learn grammar by repeating um, sentences? What do you think? Think about how many sentences that are said you say every um, every day. Do you think children can learn by repeating sentences? Sure, I think it's not learning by heart. They rather uh -huh. watch what happens around, what's happening around them, uh -huh. and what it works like. And how it works, try to work out how it works. Oh. Yeah. yeah. They right? analyze the structure and replace the questions with other they learn. They analyze the structure, right. Uh, how long have you been learning English? 11 years? Yeah, 12. Yeah, 12, 11 years. Right. Um, I would like you to uh, listen to some examples of uh, learners who have lear been learning language for three years. Right, English. So um, they are um, answering a question about what is the moon? What is the moon? What is the moon? Hmm. What is the moon? What is the moon? Like the thing? Uh huh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> 
a little bit like an orange. There's something about oranges in there. I think the moon looks like a crescent shape. That's a nice word, crescent shape. I've seen it in my dad's telescope. All right. Well, they, they are not. Uh, uh, I mean, when, when you think about the ideas behind them, uh, an astronomical object is a much better uh, answer to what the moon is. But if you think about the grammar, when a kid at the age of three years old, uh, three years knows, it is interesting. Um, think about uh, Czech and how, how often Czechs forget that in English you have to say a subject whenever you say a sentence. I saw the moon. You cannot drop the I, even though in Czech you do it. The yellow set when you don't say I, right? Uh, those English kids already know that some of the verbs in past tense are irregular and others are regular. Crucially, they can use the articles. Or something that <laughs> even after 11 and 12 years of study, had a hard time to do. And look at this. This is uh, also very interesting, right? Using the genitive form, the S, to refer to a place, right? So you have a three-year-old that has mastered all these fairly complicated things, right? By the age of three, they started talking when they were two. Uh, how is that? Now the idea is that possibly they couldn't have imitated all these sentences after their parents. Probably their parents never said, I saw the moon when I went to Nannies, right? It's more like what you were saying. They figured something out about the language. And the idea is that they had help with this figuring something out about the language. That, um, we are, the idea is that we're genetically predisposed to learn language in the same way that other creatures are predisposed to learn other things. So there is a fairly famous linguist, Stephen Pinker, who uh, believes language is something like an instinct. Right? People know how to talk in more or less the same fashion or sense that spiders know how to spin webs. Right? We are ready to learn the language because we know how to look for the language when the parents use it. Right? Uh, now, um, when, when I say language, I'm more or less talking about grammar. So you pointed out right at the beginning when I asked you what linguists study. What's grammar? What's grammar? Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's the first thing that you think of when somebody says grammar? Some rules. Rules, right. What is grammar? Um, grammar is when some... Mm -hmm. uh, when us, how we can write some... Right, that's what you do at school, right? The teachers tell you what to do. Teachers give you dictation, and then they say, <laughs> they are, take their pen, and they mark the mistakes, and then they say, that's not very good, and they say, you should go back to your textbook, right? <laughs> and that's not exactly what we do here, right? You have, you have some of it in your Yesikolatsu chain, right? That's what Yesikolatsu chain is not for. But linguistics uh, uh, is some, about something different. When we think about grammar, we think about it as that system that generates sentences, that generates correct sentences. So could you look at these uh, five, five expressions, and could you order them, organize them into one phrase? Zamiast te mnogi, bečni, krasni, That's one item after another. Can you make, can you make, get into a phrase? No, just a phrase. Just something that you're referring to. Look, look there, there is. Da, 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 da. Right? Well, I hope that as you native speakers of Czech <laughs> sit there, you will not create 120 <coughs> different combinations. Actually, you will come up with one. You should agree on one as being correct. And you should tell me that this is not good. And this is not good either. Right? And krasni no i vetřinu zaměst, that doesn't sound Czech either. And actually, no, none of the other combinations sounds good. Right? So somehow, you know, your brain knows, your grammar told you that this is the only possible combination of words. Right? Now, to some extent, you can tell me, well, this is not just rules of grammar that put words into correct words. It also has to do with meaning. OK? 
because uh, we usually use the, the more objective descriptors, the more objective adjectives, closer to the noun, and the ones that are more subjective, away from the noun. So, old beautiful house is not good. But beautiful, subjective, old house, beautiful old house sounds better, right? But grammar actually does not depend on meaning. The grammatical rules operate uh, irrespective of meaning. Take, take non-native speakers of English who try to get by without much grammar. It's raining, it's raining. Do you understand <coughs> what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. It's grammatically wrong, right? This shirt more better. This shirt more better than that one, right? No like tomatoes. You understand those sentences, they have meaning in the right context, in the right situation, you say perfectly understand, even without context, right? Um, so the meaning is there, the grammar is not. And other way around, right? Uh, look at these two chains of words. Best baggy as well and shlanky, the hysteric is me. Meaning? Nah. <laughs> Excuse me? Zanes nie mi szlaki se bez bagie hysterycki. Meaning? No. Now, one, one of them is grammatical, the other not. Right? You can appreciate that. You know that, right? Your Czech grammar tells you that the first is a sentence which has no meaning, and the second one is not a sentence, it's just a chain of words. Right? Agree? And when it thinks that the second one is a sentence? No. <laughs> right? And that is because you can compute, your brain can compute the invisible structure that is in that sentence. It can see not as a chain of words, one word after another, but it can organize it hierarch 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 into such a structure. Let me give you another word. This is a, this is a truism. Everybody knows that time flies like an arrow, goes by very fast. Right? If you try to think about it, not as one word after another, but as something that has units in there, bigger units, we will probably agree that an arrow go together, right? An arrow, an arrow is a noun, and nouns in English mean articles. Um, we would also agree that when you have a preposition, after a preposition needs something, right? And that preposition with that something also are glued together. And this whole, ex whole expression, like an arrow, tells us something about flying, how fast it flies. Right? So it's closer to flies than it is to time. So what, what uh, linguists do is try to express, try to uh, make the invisible structure visible. And so they come up with models and diagrams of sentences. Right? So there are nouns with articles that come together to form something higher with the preposition, and so it goes, right? And this is what, we, what the grammarian would do, what the linguist would do. This is what your, your brain does, more or less. And your brain tells you that this sentence, if the fruit flies like a mango, is different from the other one. If you want to interpret it, you cannot rely on the meaning, you have to rely on the grammar. Because this sentence is about insects, right? It is, it is about insects called fruit flies. And this word is not a preposition, but it's a verb, <coughs> right? You like something. You like things. You like things like mangoes, right? So a mango, again, is a unit that fits, follows, or fits together with like into a higher unit. Like what? People like different things, and fruit flies like mangoes. Right? And you also know that this now goes together. And flies is not closer to like a mango, but closer to fruit. And if you're a linguist, you will grow a different, you will grow a different tree. Right? So for linguists, words grow on trees, but the trees are upside down. Okay? And um, this is how we can demonstrate that these two sentences have each meaning and their structure um, is quite different. Okay? Now, I said, or at the beginning we said, um, words you learn from parents, right? They're inherited. You learn the words, they pass them on. So does that mean that you just have to memorize them? They are not interesting or words aren't interesting? Well, it kind of depends, but actually
actually, you can look inside words the same way that you can look inside sentences. Right? This is an example of, where does it come from, boys? Power Rangers. Right? <laughs> this is from Power Rangers, and my son, when he was first introducing this creature to me, he said it's a Megazord, and it's an unkillable robot. Well, I was quite pleased when he said unkillable, because although he constructed that world on the spot, it showed that he can see inside words. He knows that there, with the with a word short word like kill, he can create bigger words and add them to it, or er killer, or ing killing, right? And able is a nice piece because what it does is when you hang it onto a verb, you get an adjective. Right? You can hang it on a great many words, breakable, readable, doable, traceable, changeable, whatever. What else? Likeable. Think, what are you? Doable. Doable. I have doable there, but never mind. <laughs> right? Um, if I give you words that you never heard before, smoosh it. Smoosh it because it is smooshable. smooshable right? Please bug it because it is. Wuggable, <laughs> right? You can take a ball and hang it onto verbs that you have never used before. That's one thing you know. But you also know another thing. You also know that you don't say smileable, winkable is wrong, pointable is wrong, sleepable is also wrong, right? So there is something in your uh, knowledge of words that separates these verbs from these. Uh, and, and, and again, linguists would try to describe what it is. Can, can you tell me what it is? Are you linguist to, to, to some extent? Mm -hmm. Smile, wink, point, sleep. How are they different from break? Smoosh. Smoosh. <laughs> Smoosh. <laughs> don't, make it, don't make it too complicated. <laughs> you break something, right? You read something. Yeah? You change something. And that Breakable, doable, etc. But with smile, you don't smile something. You just smile, right? So there is nothing to be about, all right? Um, and of course, all of you can be negative and add a negative bit before um, an adjective and create not only unkillable but also unpredictable, undesirable, and all these other different words. Okay, and since you are from this generation who, for whom everything is mega, you also can see inside the words like mega's word and separate mega as, some, as a creative uh, bit that can be hooked on some many other words. Okay, right? um, now this is an example from a two year old trying to create a new word. Everybody knows a hedgehog? Right? Now, my daughter. Um, of, uh, she, uh, knowing the word hedgehog, one day came up with the word hedgehog. <laughs> came up with the word hedgehog because she was confronted with an <coughs> idea that she didn't have a name for. Right? And what she did was she looked inside the word hedgehog and reused a bit of it. Right? And combined it with a different word. Right? So that's again something that, that a speaker of language can do and a linguist actually tries to describe. Right? And what are these words? And they are pieces, because we can see that words break into pieces. What are they made out of? They are made out of sounds. In English, you have about 24 consonants, about 12 uh, vowels. What is the beauty of the system is that you can combine them in great many ways. So this is a spot, and this is a stop. You combine the same set of sounds. You can actually recombine these sounds into other words, right? You can think of them like post, like boss, like toss. Okay? So four distinct sounds gave you six words, but actually it's more productive than that. The, what is beautiful about it is that you have a very limited, a finite set of sounds with which you can create a great many number of words. Um, I will put it to you that that there is actually an infinite number of possibilities. Right? Although, um, if you look even in the biggest dictionary, it will stop somewhere after you know, 150,000 or something. 
We have Oxford English Dictionary listing 171 and some thousand words. Um, what do you think is the limit on the number of words? What limits the number of words in language? We said we have these sounds, there are 24 and, and 12, and you can combine them in any way you want. So what, what would limit the, the number of words in language? Usage. Usage, uh-huh. Well, you, yeah. a word that uh, has no use, you don't. Very good. If you don't need it, why would you have it, right? But also, we have cognitive capacities. Words cannot be infinite and long. You wouldn't be able to process that, right? You wouldn't be able to remember that. Uh, the longest word in Czech from school, what, what do they tell you? Nejdelší české slovo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't try to 
to make sense of it, what did you hear? Oka. 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 That is cut out of here. Tak, to Oka,